Imagine you are hiking in Yellowstone National Park. And on this hike, you are crossing over beautiful meadows full of wildflowers. And you are hiking through forests and stands of towering log pole pines. You're crossing streams. And you are getting a little tired, so you decide to take a break at this talus slope. And you're busting out your loyal Nalgene and maybe munching on a cliff bar. But as you're taking your break, and as you're biting that cliff bar, you think that you might hear something. And that could be branches scraping each other. It could be that you did not cross that stream very smoothly and your boots are just kind of squeaking and wet now. But you hear it coming from the talus. And then you spot that tiny brown puff ball. My name is Mindy Bowler. I'm a ranger here at Yellowstone National Park. And you have just seen a pica. But this could become a rare sight in the coming years as without human intervention, climate change has the potential to force these guys to extinction. And so, like I said, you heard the iconic sound of a pica on your hike, which makes sense because they're often heard before they're seen. They're very chatty Cathy's. They live in colonies, so they love to talk to each other, but they're also very territorial. And so this could be them saying, hey, back off. This is my haystack. Or it could be the warning of a predator, but the point is they love to talk, so you're probably going to hear them. And you can see that they're going to live in these little talus slopes here because they are highly adapted for those really intense environments. They're one of the only mammals that can actually survive in these um, alpine terrains. They're the one of only a handful of mammals in the lower 48 that spend their entire lives in this alpine terrain. It is far too rocky, treacherous, and cold for most other animals to survive in. And so they're very, very highly specialized to be able to live here. And that putting them in such a specialized environment and having those strict requirements makes them a super high risk for climate change. Because if they lose this environment, they cannot adapt. And so we found this out doing some research. We know that they live in the western portion of the United States, in the Cascade Mountain Range, the Rocky Mountain Range, and the Sierra Nevada Mountain Range. And so the National Park Service collaborated with Oregon State University, the University of Idaho, and the University of Colorado Boulder with these eight national parks. And through that, they decided to conduct research and replicate these experiments in each park to see how this climate change is impacting these pikas. They're focusing on gene distribution, the distribution of the pikas themselves, and then individual climate vulnerability for each area. And this was called Project Pikas in Peril. And in this project, they discovered that in places that were once abundant with pika, were losing that. There are now almost none. And the US <coughs> Geological Survey did a similar study at over 910 sites, and they found the same thing. They were finding that these pika simply were not surviving in these areas that they had previously. And the US Geological Survey found that the reasoning for this was mostly temperature. The reason pikas pick their habitats and the driving factor for their locations is climate. And they cannot survive in areas above approximately 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So with climate change warming and changing their habitats, they're running out of space. So I would like to be able to demonstrate this idea if we could get a couple of volunteer pikas potentially. Yeah, just come on up. I feel like five of you. So that's going to be the peak of our mountain, and this is going to be the base of our mountain. You just got to line up somewhere on here. Remember, pike is a territorial, so you might eep at each other. Make sure you got your space. I don't know. Eep at each other? Eep! <laughs> so right now, this whole mountain is very habitable, and they are just hanging out, munching on their haystacks, having a good time. And down here, it's staying a little warmer, but then, oh no. Coming in hot, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? And with climate change, it starts to move up and it starts to push these pikas up towards the peak of that mountain. Get my space. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be nice. I'm not gonna shove them into the wall. <laughs> you did a great job, pikas. Let's get a hand for our pikas. <laughs> but the temperature is gonna keep rising and pushing them up, and eventually they're gonna run out of space, and they're not gonna be able to go any higher up the mountain, and they're just not gonna have any more habitat. And so. 
they're just running, they're, right, they're running out of their habitat, and research is consistently showing that. And because they depend on these cooler parts of the mountains, they're an indicator species for that entire mountain range and that habitat. The pikas being impacted is not just showing that only the pikas are being affected by the weather, it's the first step showing the entire environment is being impacted. And so next will be other animal and plant species that'll suffer a similar fate. While the pika might be the first one to go extinct as a result of climate change, it absolutely will not be the last. So what can we do to prevent so many pika from going to pika heaven? Well, for starters, anything we can do to slow down climate change is going to be a huge help. So that's kind of a big ask. And so more likely we're gonna have to keep learning about projects and finding ways to adapt. I had the pleasure of working with Yellowstone's pika project this summer, and it's an adaptation of the pika, pikas in peril project as that one was discontinued early, early 2010s. And so on our project, we would go out up to these talus slopes and we would be looking for any signs of pika we could find, whether that would be seeing a pika, which is a lot harder said, or a lot easier said than done. Um, we might be listening for pika with some uh, call surveys, uh, pika scat, or those food caches that are known as haystacks, anything like that, we would go out there and take note of it in these places that we had previously done surveys and knew that we had pika. And unfortunately, what we were finding is the exact same thing as everybody else. There are not pika in the places there used to be before. And we had thermal guns to get the temperatures on these talus slopes, and I was getting readings of over 120 degrees Fahrenheit in some spots. And if you remember, they cannot survive above about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this is one adaptive program, but Glacier National Park has their own program where they focus most on the scat. What they really care about is the DNA within the scat and the pikas. So what they do is they go out and they collect the DNA, or the scat with the DNA, bring it into a lab setting, and they analyze that to try to find how pikas are related to one another, and that shows how they're moving, how they're adapting, and what's actually happening, and how they're trying to fight off climate change on their own. Because you wanna work with the animals, not against them, when you're trying to find management strategies. So that's what both of these studies are trying to do, is understand how we can manage these pikas better. One thing that's unique about the Glacier Project, though, is that it has national park volunteers. You can be a citizen scientist, you can go in for a day, and you can go help collect scat. And that's huge. Being able to open up an opportunity for the public, so it's not just up to researchers and scientists and federal employees, opens it up for everyone to have a better understanding of something like this. But that's kind of a big way that the public can get involved. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a minute to brainstorm any kind of small ways, potentially, or maybe another big way so that you, as an everyday citizen, can try to do something about what's going on with the piker right now. You can chat with folks around you. Specifically. Do we got any ideas so far? The clarifying questions. Throw out anything. Donations. Donations. Carpooling. Love carpooling. Oh, nest boxes. Oh, nest boxes. One super easy one is literally just talking about it. Spreading the word about what's going on with the pikas is huge. In 2009, the public petitioned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to add the pika to the endangered species list. Because right now, the pika is neither considered threatened nor endangered. And that petition got denied. And that made headlines, and people were talking about it, but it still made a difference, and it was pushing for change. And all of you guys can continue pushing for change, and it's essential that that happens to prevent the pikas from going extinct. Because without human intervention, climate change has the potential to push them to that brink of extinction. And we've learned this through their sensitivity to climate change and their habitats through extensive research, but we know that you guys can do something about it if you organize, volunteer, or just simply spread the word. Thank you.